Sounds good. Um, first of all, Carl, good to put a face with the name. I think you were not on the last meeting. Both Lene and I were, uh, I think, new newcomers to the committee. Yes, and I was I was grateful that you um, that you decided to be our leader. So that's I'm not sure I decided. I I <laughs> I took one for the team. We'll put it that way. Well, I'm grateful for that. So good to meet You're you. You're welcome. So, uh, first order of business is to review and approve the minutes. Uh, Cheryl sent those out last week. Uh, did everybody get a chance to read them? Were there any comments? Uh, I'll tell you, I did comment on the notes about the roundabout. Uh, I'm sorry, about the uh, fourth west, fourth south, and there was comment about the water tank, but it was listed at fourth south and eighth east. So I asked for that correction to be made. Um, and then the other clarification, which I don't think is particularly important, but I did abstain from voting myself in last time so I can claim that I didn't actually volunteer. But, uh, there were enough people to vote, so it didn't require my vote. Um, were there any other comments about the minutes? I did delete that one section because it didn't make any sense. So we just have the correct section. It was okay. five, eight, three, and now we only have three items. Okay. And then I took you off of, of the voting for yourself. Right. Welcome, Jeff. Um, we're talking about the minutes from the last meeting. If you have any comments on it. Okay. So in in view of the issue with the abstention and, and uh, Cheryl had listed as unanimous, we're going to change the vote a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll vote for the minutes. I'll ask for those that approve, those that don't approve, and those that may abstain. Um, and if nobody abstains or uh, disapproves, then we'll consider it a unanimous vote. Um, a, as opposed to going name by name on every single item, um, if that makes sense. So with that in mind, is there a motion to accept the, mo the minutes from our last meeting on April 6th? <coughs> Looks like Lene is yeah, on mute, but I'll move. Yes. Okay. I'll so move. she's moved. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Okay. Sounds like Jeff was first in on the second. And uh, all those in favor, raise your hand, give a thumbs up or whatever. I'm in favor. Uh, are there any opposed? Hands up or speak up? And any abstentions? Hands up or speak up? With no abstentions and no uh, objections, Cheryl, I think it's carried unanimously to accept the minutes uh, as amended on the comments uh, from our last meeting. Okay. okay. So what I'll do is I will um, send those to you. If you could sign them and send them back. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, um, next item on our uh, agenda is the traffic impact study. 101, I'm going to guess that's either Brady or Sam. We'll take the lead on that conversation. Marlon, I thought that was you too. Well, okay, good. We're moving <laughs> on to item number three. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be presenting on the, uh, the traffic impact studies here. So, so we, uh, obviously get, uh, new developments coming through or, or redevelopments and, and some of those, uh, we require traffic impact studies. So we did kind of want to go over that a little bit, um, kind of, you know, discuss what is a TIS when the city requires, um, TIS so TIS obviously traffic impact study, just kind of refer to it likely from that here on out. <clears throat> kind of what they what they include and uh you know um what we kind of look for when we review them and some of kind of the uh methodology methodologies and those type of things um with those so let me go ahead and share my screen here real quick can everybody see my screen okay yeah great yeah Okay, <clears throat> so let's kind of get started here. And I would, I'd like this just to be interactive. If if you have questions, um, need, need clarification or anything like that, 
uh, feel free to chime in and, and have a discussion on this. Um, don't know, you know, anybody's level with some of these type of things, familiarity or anything like that. So feel free if, if something's just not making sense or, or you just don't know what it is, feel free to kind of ask and we can kind of go into detail on something if we need to, <clears throat> or also if you feel like something's missing. So, so let's go over what is a what is a, a TIS, a traffic impact study. So it's a, it's a study that determines the potential uh, traffic impacts um, from a, a proposed development, and that can also be redevelopment as well on the roadway system. Um, it's used to identify, review, and re make recommendations um, for mitigations um, to potential impacts if there are any from that uh, that project or development. So this just kind of outlines a little bit here when the when the city requires a TIS. So for example, if we uh, receive a site plan uh, coming through reviewing, if it meets some of these these requirements, we would require a, a traffic impact study to be done. So if a development had 75 or more parking stalls, if they were required to have at least that, we would require a traffic impact study. Um, a drive up window, that's one that we always kind of want to be uh, careful with, uh, especially along um, arterial roads and all that kind of stuff. Really any any public road, just in terms of queuing back onto those roads, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not going to have that happen and, and uh, you know, we have an idea of the potential for that and to help mitigate that. Um, developments that have more than two drive approaches from dedicated streets. Um, corner lots where one or more of the streets is a collector or arterial street will require a traffic impact study. And then we also have our uh, transportation master plan also provides uh, guidance with that as well. Um, really in terms of, uh, you know, average daily traffic, ADT as it's referred to, acronym there and, and thresholds there in terms of, you know, what, what, uh, what level for a traffic impact study and kind of what we'd potentially require or could be required um, for that. So Brady, that, that graphic you just had on that screen, that's not ORM, that's AF, right? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. and so that's just, yeah, sorry, so that's just an image that's uh, really uh, one of the diverging diamond interchanges there where you kind of come over here and you actually cross over on the other side and then cross right. back over through there, yep, so. Okay, so what's what's in a TIS? Um, so so here's some, some common things that are, in, you know, in a traffic impact study. Um, it's not all inclusive. There could be some things missing, but, um, you know, we want them to, to have a, a purpose, um, you know, and the scope of the study. Um, obviously, the identifying the project location, uh, you know, wh where is it at? Um, you know, we want them to describe the analysis methodology just to make sure that it's meeting standard uh, practices there. Uh, we'll kind of go with that in a little bit of what that is and what's, what uh, is utilized in terms of that methodology. Um, there. Um, obviously, description of the, the project, um, you know, the, the data collection efforts. Um, we want, you know, things like uh, existing and, and proposed access locations, uh, trip generation and distribution. This is obviously um, what we, you know, kind of identifies uh, the intensity of the project, how many trips it's going to, um, you know, generate uh, on a daily basis, as well as, you know, during the peak periods, whatever that may be defined as. Um, any assumptions you know, used during the analysis, we want that included in the traffic impact study so that we can make sure that there, there are sound assumptions and that things are explained so that we can understand how they maybe came to conclusions or how the results came about. Um, obviously, the alternatives that are analyzed, um, is it ex existing conditions plus projects? Are there any future um, you know, scenarios involved? <clears throat> uh, any, identifying any uh, safety issues, things like uh, site distance issues and those type of things. Um, and then, uh, you know, want to have detailed results of the analysis. We want, um, you know, actually output from, you know, uh, the, the traffic simulation models that are, that are used there so we can kind of verify and, and look, at, look at those. And then obviously uh, the, the, the recommendations that they, you know, recommend in terms of mitigating potential um, um, issues. Any questions on that? Okay. So in terms of analysis methodology, the, uh, the highway uh, capacity manual is um, kind of the standard practice for that. Um, it, uh, you know, term of level of service, uh, LOS is used to kind of, it's a, it's a scale from A to F, 
that with A being the best and, and F being the worst in terms of uh, looking at a delay per vehicle um, for that. So when we're looking at um, intersections and they're being analyzed, um, this is you know the, the standard practice that is used and the methodology that is used. So we want to make sure, you know, when they're coming through, that they are uh, meeting meeting these requirements and and including this uh, methodology. Um, there's different thresholds in terms of signalized versus um, unsignalized intersections. Um, so here's here we got a little table right here um, with the level service A through F <clears throat> for signalized intersections and unsignalized intersections. And one thing to, to note with that, if you kind of look, um, let, let's go to a level service. Um, D, for example, if we were looking at that, you'll notice that the delay for a signalized intersection is higher than the delay for an unsignalized intersection. And that's really, it's more, the expectation is that people are more willing to wait longer at, a, at an intersection. Um, for a couple reasons, they understand that it's, you know, usually more congested there, as well as, um, you know, the, they know that eventually they're going to get a green arrow or a green signal or something like that to let them eventually move through. So it's really kind of a, a expectation and perception thing, you know, where unsignalized intersections um, that, you know, that that delay and expectation and, and willingness to wait there, you know, isn't uh, isn't as high as it would be as a at a signal. So any questions with any of that yet? Uh, I have a question. Um, so for average delay, like what's the methodology? So the way you get that is essentially like, if, if I'm hitting a green light, it's a zero delay. Correct. And then, so you, how do you, so like, do you count the number of cars that go through a, um, like go through with no delay? And then you like, if someone, if a whole batch stands like one signal, you then average that out. Is that like how it works or like, what's the methodology? Yeah. Yeah. And th the highway capacity manual kind of, kind of defines that. And, and it is that, I mean, it, it's those who are, are stopped at that red light and it's the time that they're sitting there waiting. And then based off the, the number of vehicles that are there waiting. Right. And that's, that's averaged out. Um, and I kind of point down here just a little bit, Jeff. So on a, on a two way stop control, that's, um, that's based on the worst movement um, would kind of be identified. And that's that's what would be reported um, where like a signalized intersection, that average delay is for the entire um, intersection that they look at. So they're they're actually looking at all, all approaches and, and, and movements in terms of correct. Yep. To, to get an overall, you know, level of service to determine whether, um, you know, uh, the intersection is operating um, acceptable. And as kind of note down here at the bottom, uh, the highway capacity manual is defined, you know, level service D or better as um, acceptable. So once we start getting into the level service E or F, that's when we're, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, obviously F is failing conditions, you know, E, e is we're, we're approaching there. You could look at it as like a, a glass of water. A has a little bit of water, B, C, and as we get to F, it's overflowing with, uh, with water there. So that's kind of with that. So does that, does that help answer your question? Anything else on that? So that, that that's really important. I mean, um, you know, th that's really what these traffic studies are kind of kind of based on, and, and that kind of stuff um, is is this methodology here that the Highway Capacity Manual has has defined with that. So. Do you do you car count like do you determine this based on like those lines in the road? I'm more just curious than anything like the the wires. Or is it like by camera? What? So, so I'll go with this. So, so really, with these traffic impact studies, so they have we have um, analysis tools. It's really uh, micro simulation software that is utilized oh, okay. in these. And so, um, we'll go over here a little bit, um, kind of, you know, data collection, what that is, and and then that that gets put into these um, simulation models, um, and that's where they they calculate it. Um, you know, they have the methodology of the HCM based in there and then that's how we it spits out the results and that's how you kind of get get that information um, I think you're just kind of more referring to like uh, the detection and all that kind of stuff at intersections initially I think in terms of kind of determined number of vehicles and and stuff like that there so so it's not it's not to that that it's actually we you know they, they take these they, they do data collection they put that information to these simulation models and then they spit out the results with that did you say you're going to cover the data collection in the farther in your presentation here? Yeah, yeah, I think here in a few slides here. So so kind of the TIS process, this is kind of typical of what you could see, you know, with this. Um, 
where, where we want we want the, the existing conditions documented, right? And so that that is the data collection. That's where we're going out, um, getting getting the traffic counts and, and those type of things there. Um, and then obviously an important thing is to estimate the new trips, right, of the proposed development. Um, and this is based off um, ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers. They have a, a trip generation manual, and that's kind of like the standard practice to utilize that to estimate um, trip generation. We'll, we'll go over that here in a little bit as well and kind of look at um, some charts and all that kind of stuff on a specific land use and kind of look at what that looks like. Once those um, trips are, are uh, calculated, those are assigned to the network. And so, um, you know, you, you look at and assigning them, you know, in terms of uh, uh, distribution and all that kind of stuff where potentially people could be coming from going to, um, you know, existing land uses, um, you know, that are generators, uh, freeway locations and all that kind of stuff to help kind of get that distribution as well as the existing uh, traffic patterns. Once those are done, you know, the, the TIS will, will assess the impact. So again, using the highway capacity manual uh, thresholds, uh, looking at um, existing conditions versus kind of that plus project conditions and what, what are the impacts that we're seeing, if any. Um, and then um, determine the, the appropriate mitigations. Um, I put on here like a signal, right? There could be some intersection that's uh, failing and, and before, before the project come in, it's operating acceptable, um, it could come with a project and it's failing, uh, we do signal warrants, so signal warrants meet and as a result, look at uh, potentially putting in a signal because of the project. Um, turn lanes as well, um, that could be a, a left turn lane, right turn lane, uh, deceleration lanes, those type of things, um, as well as potentially roadway widening with that. So, okay, so a little bit with uh, data collection here. Um, typically, you know, it's also depending on the land use of when it's, uh, you know, considered a, Kind of the, the peak peak trip um, generation time, um, but typically uh, traffic volumes are done on counted on a, a Tuesday or Wednesday or a Thursday. We consider those, those typical. Um, you kind of get on Mondays and Fridays, people uh, leaving early or or people are gone in general or coming back from a vacation and those type of things. So so it's typically counts are done on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, they're done between the AM and PM uh, peak periods. So that's typically seven to nine and uh, in the morning and four to six in the afternoon. <clears throat> and so they'll go out there and they'll count for those two hours. Um, they'll, they'll analyze that and uh, um, determine when the actual peak hour was. Um, so that's the consecutive uh, 15 minute um, periods for that so <clears throat> would, would determine the peak hour. What if there's an in and out going in on University Parkway, would they maybe change that to catch the lunch hour? Sure. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And and so so it is dependent, like I said, kind of on the land use. Uh, on a Saturday, if you had um, a, a a big you know a department store or something like that was coming in, right? Would maybe want to look at a Saturday and see what that looks like because that could be the the peak generator and all that kind of stuff can could actually result in the uh, the busiest time and, and show like the the greatest impacts um to the to the roadway network so it, it is dependent kind of on that land use and when you expect to have people come and go with that so the, the thing that you know you can still have the project generate a lot of trips but maybe the saturday volumes are really low so they wouldn't but it would be one that you'd likely maybe want to require Saturday as well in terms of including your typical AM and PM peak, just to kind of make sure you're capturing everything there. So. And how is that determined as to, to make sure you're capturing everything? In terms of. So the geographic area, what's going why would you Why would you do a Saturday? Or, or there's well, a like a set of criteria that says, oh, yeah. Better, yeah, better do a Saturday. So so, so I think on that, like I said, it's kind of like on the land use and, and looking at that. And, and you can use um, uh, w when they kind of do their their uh, trip generation stuff that, that you can kind of determine um, w what is generating the most trips. Was it a Saturday? What, what is it? At, was it a weekday? Um, you can have times, for example, uh, a school, right, can kind of go in and, and maybe you'd, you'd want to make sure that you're capturing the, the peak period of a school and all that kind of stuff if something was um, going in, in, in right next to it. So, so if you knew there was a swap meet, you know, just three blocks away every Saturday, would that be an important thing to know? How would the engineering firm know about that? Or how would you make sure that they knew about that? 
Well, I, and a lot of this stuff, and we don't always get it, but there are some firms who do reach out, and that way we can kind of discuss those type of things and, and require those and ask ask for that to be done. If they submitted it and we knew about it, we would still, you know, make, that would be a comment, right? Hey, the, you know, there's this heavy uh, generator of trips um, on a Saturday that's within the vicinity of the, the study area. We'd like you to include a, a Saturday um, analysis as well. How do you determine the vicinity of the area? It's really just kind of looking at, you know, you want um, um, adjacent uh, signalized like intersections and all that kind of stuff. There's there's not some specific criteria for that. You look at the kind of the, the project location. Um, you want to make sure you're capturing, you know, uh, yeah, like I said, adjacent intersections um, really with it. And that's so it's kind of it kind of just depends on, on the on the project location of what you're looking at, um, as well as kind of like the intensity of of the project as well, um, to where you feel like that could really, you know, um, impact other locations as well. So there's a little bit of art with the science. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with, with it all, it's not just specific, um, you know, um, with that, and not not some easy way to always determine to determine what is required um, with that. Um, it, it varies. Any other questions with that? Kind of the, the traffic stuff? So can I ask one thing? So how do you determine um, if something else needs to be considered? So if someone brings up a point to you, I need you to look at this swap meet that ha happens three blocks away. Um, is it the engineering firm that needs to determine that or does that then come when you do your checklist? Um, uh, well, I, I don't know if there's specific with that, um, really. Um, in terms of, I mean, I guess we'd have to know that it's there, right? In order to to have it have it be required um, with it. Um, but like I said, there there's still just you know. So somehow we'd want to let the engineer know that that you know that this is whether it's 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 others or or ourselves or something like that right to get that information to that we feel like it's not capturing you know um potentially um a, a peak time period of when it's the busiest or something like that yeah and, and there there also are there's tools out there as well um that that are available that we can help kind of evaluate um, some of the the peak time frames and stuff like that. Um, so so what Jeff was kind of mentioning, you know, referring to like the detection and stuff like that. So we do have information at uh, signalized intersections um, if if that uh, technology is there to kind of look at that. So so we could look at you know a, a Saturday um, that's gone by, uh, you, you know a week ago or, or whenever, and, and as long as that's up, kind of depending on when it was set up to kind of really look at, is that busier than what the, the weekday is? Um, what, what does traffic look like during that time? Um, so it kind of helps, can help with that to kind of help determine, you know, when is, when is the peak period um, kind of at? Um, so so you, could, you could potentially do that. You could look at it for the weekdays, you could look at it for a Saturday and all that kind of stuff to kind of determine um, when that peak time frame is. Does that make sense? So, so there are existing tools out there that do help us kind of look into that and help us kind of to make that determination. So when you say existing tools, do you mean existing data? Exactly, yes. Yeah, so, so those, those detectors, you know, they're collecting data and all that kind of stuff um, on there. Um, and so we can kind of utilize that to help us kind of determine when, when's the busiest time of day and, and is, it a, is it a weekday, is it a, a, a weekend, is it a Saturday, those type of things. And I think, too, just to, to interject, too, Brady, some of this, too, when we look at our projects and we have traffic impact studies, if there's neighborhood meetings or, or, or things of that nature, if there's some sort of nuance about the area that we're not aware of, like, say, there's a swap meet that, 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 that happens and we weren't aware of that use there or it's a use that that's permitted, but it actually generates a lot of traffic and it's usually on a Saturday morning from eight to 10. And if we're not aware of that, some, usually something like that surfaces and then we can go ahead and instruct that, that firm to go ahead and, and, and 
and include that in their analysis and, and, and collect that data to see what, what type of impact there is. Because I guess what we're trying to say too is that even though a development comes in and they bring in their impact study, if there's holes in it, if they're, if they're missing some data, there is a process to make sure that, that we're collecting all that. So we, we try and do the, the best we can to make sure we get as much data and information as, as we can to make sure that whatever's coming in is not going to create any more problems than, than what are there currently. Great questions, though. It really is. Um, so, so on that, back back to kind of the, the data collection part. So, I mean, there's obviously the traffic volumes that are uh, collected, but also, you know, when, when they're going out there, need to be looking at, you know, obviously the just the roadway geometry, the, the number of lanes, uh, uh, you know, making sure that they're capturing right turn lanes, uh, dual left turn lanes, those type of things so that they're ap accurately replicated in their in their models. Um, you know, speed limits, um, whether the intersection signalized or, or un unsignalized, access locations, um, is a signal timing, is it, uh, uh, does it have a left turn arrow? Um, is it permissive protected? Um, which means, you know, it, you know, if there's enough vehicles there, you'll get a protected left turn at the other times, you know, we got the flashing yellow arrow and that kind of happens there. Um, observing queuing that happens out there, we want to make sure that these models are accurately representing uh, existing conditions, um, crosswalk locations, those those type of things. And so I kind of did this little photo down here on this bottom right. This kind of looks like a video game, but this is when I started out, this is actually, you know, go out and sit at an intersection, use this to actually count um, the, the locations. Uh, there, so so this is a, a JMR counter here that you actually use and and uh, use to count the intersections. A lot of times, people these days actually set up cameras and those type of things and go out there, set those up, and then come back and count them. But it was a uh, almost felt like I was playing a video game those days. So, what are those when you see the line across the road? Is that like cars? How does that work? So, so those are tube counters. So those are typically stuck out there and they're used to collect uh, traffic volumes. They can also be used to um, collect speeds and also vehicle classifications um, as well. And that's typically done, you know, when you'd see one or if you see more than one tube, you can capture some of that uh, like speed and, and uh, vehicle classification because it'll look at like the axle spacing and all that kind of stuff that goes across there to help kind of identify that. And I think too, I don't know if if Taylor still uses them, Brady, but we do have some pucks. They, they're about the size of an iPad, and we'll actually nail those down in, into the asphalt centered on the travel lane, and it, and it essentially tries to do the same thing, kind of collect the, uh, the electromagnetic field of, of the car, and it collects that data too. But I don't, I don't, I don't know if we have very many left because I don't think it's anything that they, they still make. So, And with the tubes, they're obviously, you know, you, you got to keep an eye on those because obviously they can get ripped up if they're out there, right? Somebody drives over them or they're out there, they kind of get tore up and then they're at not actually, you know, collecting the appropriate data. But um, th and those are typically used um, to kind of get your uh, kind of daily traffic volumes and stuff like that um, there. So we kind of do like a people call like a 40 hour tube count with that to kind of help determine what you're kind of seeing there on a daily basis. So typically someone sits in a car and just counts cars. Is that how the engineering firms do them now? Uh, you know, I don't I don't know. I think some of them can still do it this way, Lene, and that's what I'm saying. This little counter here that I have on here, yeah, some people can actually sit there and actually count, right? So they're pushing pushing it for each one of these, and they, they put the, the direction of the intersection. But um, uh, other times, uh, some are using uh, cameras, and they'll go out there and actually set up a camera on the signal pole that will you can actually see all the, the, the intersection locations and all that kind of stuff. Then they could go back and actually just review review that and start and count that way to kind of determine the traffic volumes. And does it say in their report how they collected the data? Um, oftentimes, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't uh, um, kind of specify that, how that was collected. Yep. Okay, any, any other questions on data collection? Okay. Okay, so this is just a little bit of kind of the intersection analysis tools here. Um, there, there are multiple um, uh, traffic simulation softwares out there um, that uh, you can use. I would say, well, there, there's a handful of them, really. Um, the, the, 
one that we, we obviously see a lot is uh, called Synchro um, or, or Sim Traffic. Um, those are used kind of for uh, traditional four leg intersections, kind of your, your simple intersections, traditional intersections. Um, four leg, they can be uh, T intersections and that kind of stuff. But um, we start getting anything uh, uh, complex back to like our diverging diamond interchange, uh, continuous flow intersections, um, through turns and all that kind of stuff. Um, this VISM here is, is um, used for that. Um, synchro and sim traffic, it's actually from the, the same firm there, um, but the, the analysis is a little bit different. Um, synchro is what's called deterministic. Um, and so you're basically putting uh, information in and um, you, you, it's going through equations from the highway capacity manual and those are just being out, outputted to you. Um, some, some traffic is uh, stochastic and so that it's, it's variable. Um, people, you know, majority times will, you know, do a minimum of, of 10 simulation runs. And so you get kind of the, the variability, um, kind of randomness of typical traffic out there. And then those results are averaged together um, to kind of get your output there um, with that. Um, down here is just kind of some uh, typical measures of effectiveness um, um, that, that are used, that are collected with these um, um, analysis tools, these, these simulation softwares. Um, the, the delay that we see, that's what we use to kind of get that, that level of service. That's where we get that um, delay, um, it's the seconds per vehicle there. Um, 95th percentile queue lengths. So that's the, the length of queues at an intersection that are only um, exceeded 5% um, of the time. And those are typically the, the threshold used um, when, when designing. Um, uh, an intersection and all that kind of stuff. So if you're, if you're looking at something new and you have a traffic analysis done, um, it'll be design, designed to, to what the analysis shows in terms of the 95th percentile queues. Um, and then also you can get travel times um, from that analysis as well to kind of determine, um, you know, before the project, this is what a travel time was. And after the project, this is what it was just to kind of show potential uh, increase or, or non-change um, between, you know, the, the project and with and without it. Any questions there? So I have one. So your 95th percentile Q length, is that, is there like an ABCD rating on that? No. Oh, no. It, it, no it, it, so, so you're basically just comparing that to what's existing. Um, so at an intersection, let's say, you know, you've got a, a left turn lane there and it has um, 150 feet worth of storage. Um, but you go and you do your analysis, and after you do it, let's say before the project, it shows that the queue was 135 feet. So what that's telling us is that that the the storage length is um, has has enough ca capacity to kind of fit fit everybody in there. The project comes back, you know, with additional project trips. You look at it; and it's 100, and, and let's say 200, just a kind of extreme. Well, okay, now we know that that uh, potentially there's going to be people in the left turn kind of queuing back through the through. The through movements, we want to, you know, extend that um, left turn so that we can ensure that it's going to kind of fit the capacity needed. Okay, so stupid question. So does, 95, does, the, does that mean that 95% of the people get through the light? No. <laughs> no, no, it does not. It's just, it's just in terms of, it's just a, a length. And that length is, um, you know, 95% of the, the time people can and fit within that storage length. That's all it is. Yeah. Any questions there? Okay. So very important part in, in kind of traffic impact studies is obviously the trip generation. Um, as I mentioned before, ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers, is kind of the standard practice in terms of determining uh, trip generation. Um, they've got nine land use groups. Um, those are kind of listed here. Um, it totals 170 different land use types. And so going through doing your, your trip generation, you want to have, make sure that whatever that use is that's going in is, you know, um, accurately represented in, in the ITE, just in terms of that what's most similar to, to the development there. Um, so, so this is just a, an image from, from ITE. So this is the, the services um, land use group right up here. And so what it kind of has, this has like a, a list of land uses under this land use group. Um, 
you know, banks, if, if the project was going to be, have a, a bank and it was going to be a walk-in bank, you know, you'd use a 911, land use code 911. Um, you know, if you wanted to come through and you're doing a, a fast food restaurant with a drive through window, you want to use 934. So they have these and you want to obviously just pick the one that best represents them, that project there. Do those um, correlate the trips at all, those numbers, or is that just a number given? No, that, that's just the number given that kind of reflects that that land use. We'll go over that a little bit here, Lene. So so let's just take a little look at like 934, right? Fast food restaurants with, uh, with a drive-through window. So, so this is one chart that you would see kind of in the ITE manual here. And um, this is this is based on a daily. So so you kind of look up here. Um, this is talking on a weekday is what, you know. So once again, going back to your, your study, if they were doing it on for a weekday, you'd, you'd be using this. Um, the, the vehicle trip ends is kind of really the the units of that study. So so let's say you had a fast food restaurant coming through with a drive through and it was uh, 2000 square feet. Right. That's that's kind of what you're looking at. And so this is per thousand square foot. So so they give you, you know, your average rate here of what that is. Um, and at that time. So what you do if you had 2000 square foot, you know, fast food restaurant to kind of get a, a rate of trip generation for the day, you take two times by this this number right here to kind of um, get get that. And that would kind of equate to what you would expect in terms of a daily trip volume um, there. Um, there are times um, when, you know, so, so this line represents this average rate here. And there are times when a, a, a best fitted curve is provided um, with this as well. And that would, uh, that's what's kind of down here at this bottom. It says fitted curve equation not given, but there are those times um, when that is given. And there are uh, requirements in the ITE manual to kind of suggest when you need to use like the average rate, when you need to, you know, use the, when it's recommended to use the fitted curve, as well as potentially collecting local data. Um, they have information in here on some studies and there's just not enough studies done, small sample size. And, and so you might have to go out and really kind of collect local data to um, kind of um, get a good representation of what the, those project trips might be. Um, ITE, I think, is oftentimes conservative um, in its trip generation um, with that, um, you know, but and I, that's good because that'll help show us, you know, kind of more of those, you know, kind of potential impacts with that. But and, and that's a lot of times with like mixed use developments and stuff like that. And I think that they're getting better and getting some new data and stuff like that as well um, with that. So, so when you when well, you say conservative there, Brady, what you mean is that they're going to overestimate the number of vehicle trips so that you yeah. design to a maximum capacity as yeah. opposed to, Okay. It seems like like research and, and, and studies like that stuff is done. Like I said, especially in mixed use developments, when you when you've got you've got residential stuff, you've got office, you've got retail and all that kind of stuff. It definitely tends to overestimate those trips. It's not really capturing really well, kind of that that internal capture that you get of people kind of just walking to those places and and stuff like that, or, or biking because they're in such close proximity. With that. Okay. So, so this is, so obviously that's weekday. This, just this next one is actually just the, the AM kind of peak here. You know, it talks about, you know, uh, one hour between seven and nine here. It gives you this, this average rate here again. So again, if we were a 2,000 foot square or 2,000 square foot uh, fast food restaurant, we'd, you know, it'd be, you'd be looking at like 80, 80 trips during the AM peak hours, what you'd be expecting um, with that. Um, during during the PM peak here, um, you'd be looking at uh, you know 64, 65, 66 type of a thing there. So so that that's used that that standard practice there, but it is an important part of the the traffic impact study. It's it's important to have to to make sure that they are whether they're using the average rate, whether they're using the fitted curve appropriately based on IT recommendations um, with that um, there. So. Any questions with kind of trip generation? Okay, so I think this is it. This is, I think, really the last slide that we have. So, so when, when we when this comes through to us, I mean, we're we're really looking at you know simply you know with some of the analysis results and even the approach taken in the study, like, does it make sense? 
right? Um, and, and that's looking at um, the results. Um, for example, you might look at uh, an intersection in existing conditions, and let's say that it um, has, you know, 30 seconds of delay with it, and that's existing conditions. And then let's go say you've got the, uh, the project, which is adding trips to it, but for the same intersection and location, the, uh, the, the report's showing maybe 25 seconds of delay. And you'd ask yourself, okay, so trips have increased, but my delay decreased. Why is that, right? So those are some of the things that you do want to look for and look at. And there are some instances that that can be the case. Um, for example, a, a project that adds a lot of right turns could actually reduce um, delay at an intersection because, you know, they're, they're shown as cars still going through, but they're not having a lot of delay because they don't have to wait there um, as similar as like a left turn would need to um, in terms of associated delay. So there are those instances, but they are more rare. But those are some of the things that, we, you know, we want to look out for and, and be aware of just to make sure that it makes sense. I mean, that's that's a bit the big part of it. Um, you know, verifying the assumptions that were made, making sure that, like I said before, that those are kind of laid out and, and that the, the data um, provided is, is reasonable and accurate. Um, there's a terminology of garbage in, garbage out, right? If, if that, that traffic being, you know, volumes being used aren't, aren't accurately represented, right? Um, you're not going to get the accurate results. So garbage in, kind of garbage out. So so that is something that that um, you need to make sure um, that the, 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 the data is sound with that. Um, and that goes again with the trip generations as well as um, the, the roadway geometry, making sure, um, you know, that uh, it's accu accurately representing what's out there, um, that they're not assuming that there's an extra through lane at an intersection or, or that's what's kind of coded in their model when there's not. Um, so potentially things are looking better than maybe what they would be um, with that. Um, a big one is is comparing um, existing conditions to um, the plus project conditions, um, kind of getting an idea of, of helps quantify like that magnitude of what um, th those impacts really are. Um, there are instances in, in the existing roadway network um, at, at locations where um, before a project even comes in, that the level service at intersections could be unacceptable. They could be level service E um, or, or even F. And a, a project does come in, but when comparing those from one to another, um, maybe they only are adding a couple seconds of to, to an intersection and all, all that. So their actual impact to what's existing isn't significant. Um, and that can be just not even for, you know, unacceptable conditions, but actually, you know, um, conditions where, where things are level service D or better, where the, the project's only adding, you know, a couple seconds to an intersection um, as well. So that, that's important to know. So um, what are the actual, you know, impacts, kind of like that delta between those two two scenarios that you're looking at there. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that that, um, that the study is meeting all of all of our standards, all of our ordinances. Um, and I think that's a lot of times like in terms of like access location and and those type of things that were, were you know, in, in appropriate locations with that. Um, and then we also want to evaluate the, the recommended mitigations, um, you know, um, if they're provided, uh, do they make sense? Um, what does that What does that really mean? Is is this you know uh, is it a a project issue? Is it a, an existing conditions issue? Um, those type of things. So, Sam, anything you want to add? Um, the one thing I that, that I do want to say is that is is usually impact studies come in, and that's usually the first thing we do is we look at their the approach what what makes sense and there's usually holes in it i mean there's I, I can't think of a time where we've had an impact study that was submitted and we accepted it um there's usually something that they, they have to look at there's something that they forgot there's usually you know there they might be a little low on some of the volumes trip generation might might make sense but then they're they're talking about hey there's there's no mitigation measures re required so there's always something that 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 we look at and i mean i i think to 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 uh, marlin's point it, it it is an art but that's where you know you bring in engineering judgment and and you realize hey the the these are the existing conditions and we know what's going on there so we can tell right away you know <laughs> are, you know are, are these is this you know engineer trying to come in a little low and in, in hopes of not 
you know, having to have their client put in more Im improvements than not, knowing that it's going to go through an, an, an iterative process because the engineers are trying to make money that they, that they, they have a reputation and they're doing what they can, right? They're, they're doing what they can to, to help out their, their client. A lot of them already know that something's going to change and something has to be done, but they want to go through somewhat of a process. Now, usually it's not an um, egregious thing, and, and a lot of them re recognize that, hey, yeah, we, we know that it makes sense to put in a, a right turn pocket or, or whatnot, or the volumes are that they are. And, 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 and to their point, too, they try and access some of our data, and sometimes our data is a little bit old, so they have to go out and 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 and, and collect it. So I, I guess I mean just to to reiterate that this this is usually an iterative process, and we do. There are quite a few times where we have to get on the phone and talk through the process, and then I think both come to realize, oh yeah, we missed this, we, we missed that. Yeah, we can include this and that to make sure that it isn't garbage in and garbage out. May I ask a question? Sure. Do they typically submit the data with the report for you to peruse, or do you need to typically call them and ask them if you have questions about it? No, usually there's. I want to say usually part of the, the part of the report is, is is that data. They'll actually show the counts. They'll actually have numbers. I mean, right right in the beginning of, of the report is usually um, an executive summary, and then it goes through some mitigation and, and things like that. And usually there's an appendix in the back that'll have that data. And then we can take, and, and usually if, if, if we can, we, we will take that data and compare it to ours. Because if, if, if we have, I, I know there, there has been a case where we had data that was older and the data was higher than what was submit than what was submitted for existing, and this was all pre-COVID. So we kind of said, "Hey, I think you may you may need to go out and re-verify re your counts because, yes, al although you stayed here that you counted it, we actually have some data that's older and it was higher, and 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 we're also part of this growing metro area of, of, of Provo and Orem. So I don't see." people leaving I actually see more and more folks coming here so but if they go out and, and, and do that I mean in this case they, they, they came back with numbers that were more in in harmony with, with what we are seeing but I mean there is that case of yeah no traffic is dropped so then we look at land uses and, and, and some other things to make sure that what they have submitted is true and correct so so yeah to that point Lene too yeah I mean our expectation is to always have that information, right? And it, like Sam said, usually included in an appendix where um, there's there's the, the traffic counts, what they had, and it's kind of identifying the, the day that they counted. And that, that information is actually usually in the report as well, but it kind of shows that and, and identifies kind of the, the peak the peak hour um, through there, um, usually, you know, as well. And then they'll have, you know, the, the level service. So, so they do the output of, um, to, to kind of how they calculate, you know, the, the delay to, to um, associate the level service to, to the intersections, as well as the, the queuing information that comes directly from those uh, um, simulation software. So, and if that is not provided, we do, so essentially we would ask, right? That would be one of the comments and stuff like that. Hey, provide your, your traffic account data or pro provide the output from the, the simulation model that kind of shows us this, this information so that we can actually, um, verify that that it's um accurate um because there is that potential when they're transferring stuff from those outputs to tables in their report that they can they can you know uh, you know miss miss push a number and all that kind of stuff and and so things aren't, aren't accurate uh, accurately represented and and we do look at that and kind of make sure that that um what they're reporting um makes sense um for that so hopefully that helps. So, so to answer your question is yes, we, we expect it to be there. It's not always there. And if it's not, we'll ask for it. So I, I work for an engineering firm that does transportation. Um, and we, we do some really big projects. I don't think we've ever worked for the city of Orem. Um, but I would say that the goal is to, to balance, you know, the, the, uh, 
the client wants to spend as little money as possible to improve the neighborhood. They want to build their building. The city wants the best possible infrastructure improvements and, and realistically to, to help that project, but also help other just general city flow, take advantage of the opportunity. And the engineer is in the middle trying to negotiate with both of them. And a conscientious engineering firm will find the middle ground as quickly as possible and reasonably as possible um, for for both sides. But it's yeah. it's not always easy, particularly the bigger the project. When you have a multi-billion dollar transportation project, those reports get really, really detailed and intense. Yep. Well, well, well said, Marlon. Absolutely. Um, we, we look okay. at a lot of time with the developer. It's they're just wanting to check that box and and kind of move on and, and spend the little yep. as possible. Absolutely. So how do you determine the how do I say this? I'm not quite sure how to say this um, in the right words, but the the distance of the impact. Project. You, you cut out Renee, uh, the the what of the impact? So, you know, we're just going to, this engineer saying, we're just going to look at this block. We're just going to look right. at this block. But but there's obviously going to be impact extending beyond that city block. At what point do you say, you know, we need to look at this impact, a more extended impact? Well, I still think it kind of comes down to the intensity of that use in terms of the, the trips. Um, you know, we have some guidance in our transportation master plan, I think, when it gets a certain number of trips to kind of look at, uh, you know, quarter mile or, or half a mile um, kind of locations and stuff like that as well. So it kind of goes back to, to still um, kind of that art and, and all that kind of stuff in terms of what that, what that project, what you'd estimate that project to kind of um, uh, generate. I mean... You know, it's hard to, for example, on a project that's at Center Street and State, for example, to, you know, that comes through and, and um, you know, you, you going all the way down to the interchange and, and you know, kind of associating that, that you know, they're, they're uh, impacting that interchange. And so they need to make, you know, improvements as a result of that, um, you know, with that. So I think that's, that's a... Uh, I mean, I think an example is like the LDS church when they build their temples. I mean, I remember the Mount Tipanogos temple. They actually put in a road uh, in front of the old Manila church because they knew that that little tiny road that was there, um, I think it was a negotiated thing, um, handled the traffic volume that was anticipated by that temple being put in. And that was a good two mile distance. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I guess my question is, do I'm guessing they volunteered that or did some engineers say this is going to have an impact on this street? What can you do about it? What can we do to work together to fix that? How would something like that be handled? Either either they volunteered it or the engineer asked for the city asked for it. Yeah. And the answer is it could be either way. It depends on if they're aware of it. Uh, most engineering firms, if they're aware of it, they would try to offer a mitigation because you don't want it to come back from the city with, well, you forgot this, you forgot that, you forgot this, you know, so the engineer wants to account for it, but they may not know the lay of the land. And then, you know, an example going in right now is the temple on in Orem here. They're making that a five lane on Geneva road, just past the temple. So going South, it'll still be that two lane, but coming North up to the intersection, they're going to make the improvements. Well, and, and I think to that point too, there, there's two different points with, 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 with temples, I guess, since we're talking about temples. One, you're going to have the huge amount of traffic the weeks prior to it being dedicated. That's probably the most impactful a temple is. Once they're in operation, and, 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 that's, and that's the thing too, and Brady can speak to this, it's hard to find temples in the, in the ITE trip, trip generation because it's not there. So you either go out and you get, you collect some data to see what, what you can see, like looking at Payson or Provo or, 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 or Mount Tim and, and get that, that data. And then you look at it and then you look at the, um, you look at, at what, what, what types of trips. And then, you know, for that site, we actually made sure that they put in a center turn lane, even though, I mean, and that's part of what that, roadways section is supposed to be 
but if but if there were no plans for Geneva Road, if if if, if UDOT was saying, hey, we're just going to keep it at two lanes, then that's where that impact study is going to say, hey, look, we're going to need a, a right a right turn decel because you're going to have people traveling 55 miles an hour. They need to slow down because that radius is kind of tight. Give them a safe way to do that, and then you start looking at okay, how many lefts are going to be here, and that's when the engineer is going to look at well, you have you have two access points. One's off of Geneva Road, right straight to the temple, and there's also one further to the north. So then when they do their model, they assume that, well, you know what, there, there's going to be a, a, a few folks that are going to look at a map and say, hey, let's go ahead and take this, this route, or let's go straight to it. And then it's kind of a best guess as to as things even out, what are, what are folks going to do? And they do a 60-40, a 50-50, 70-30 split, and then you just kind of run through those. And if we don't think it looks right, then we can say, hey, I think you need to change your assumption, move these around. It's going to be more here, there, or whatever. Um, but, you know, there, there's definitely certain areas. If there's a median there, well, then we can't assume a left in. And if there's only one access point, then obviously they're going to have to go, or you know, some sort of a roundabout way. So I guess to... Lene's point, it just kind of depends on where the development is and where their access points are because in some cases, yeah, they're, they're, we're going to have to look at a, a, a half mile or a quarter mile out because this is how they have, have to get there. And then I guess an, another point to be made is they're doing that. If some of these areas are close to a signal and they're showing, hey, it works great, then we want to look at their synchro model to make sure that what they put in there for signal timing is actually what is there as opposed to being something that's optimal for what makes their development work. So yeah, there's a lot of moving parts in a traffic in, 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 uh, impact study. And, and if all else fails, I, I know Paul used to, on occasion, he would get up early and, and go, if there was a, a some sort of a use that had a really large AM peak, he would get up early and go sit there and watch it and then just kind of get a feel for where uh, you know a lot of those folks are and then and, and and the same could be for for the pm peak I, I mean we could go sit there and say you know these guys are saying it's 80 20. i think it's more of a 50 50. well we might have to go out there and visually watch it and just come back and say hey look your model's wrong you, you can't do it that way you got to switch it up so i mean I guess that the point is, is that this is an iterative process, and we do, we do try and do our best to make sure we get it right. So, how much do you guys use Google Maps for uh, what do I say, projected direction that people are uh, routes that people we will be directed on? Well, we have our aerial photos that that we use for our development tracking. We got so yeah, if we look at there, I mean, and, and what I try and do is the only other person that I know that. I kind of understand their driving habits is my wife. So I figure, okay, if my wife is heading south, how is she going to get to this spot? Because she doesn't use her phone. She's just going to know generally where it's at. How is she going to get there from southwest, east, or north? Because she drives totally different than I do. I always try to make sure that I can do a – I hate to make a left. I always like to make rights. So I will look at an area because I hate to go across traffic, especially if it's, you know, multiple lanes. So I try and make it easy. It might take a, a little bit longer, but I'd, I'd rather make a right than a left. So I guess, yeah, we, we do look at Google Earth and we look at see if there's obstructions, you know, things that make sense or don't make sense. And, and you can look on maps and just kind of see through parking lots or roads kind of where there's more tire marks, you know, because there is kind of a, a silhouette there on, on the asphalt. You can kind of get a feel for where people generally are. I think it's kind of generational too, don't you think? I know my kids are always putting it in their phone and I'm just kind of driving because I know kind of where it is and trying to figure out what's like you. Do I want to turn yeah. around what's the best way? Yeah. yeah, and it's usually the the kids are the ones who get there and it's us that are going down and then having to do a U-turn and then do a U-turn. Like, ah, I missed it. There it is. Where's this at? I think it was right here. And then you're we're probably the worst example there is. <laughs> okay, how about another question? Sorry, real quick. Um. Is the length of the deceleration lane determined by the speed on the street? How do you determine the length, the necessary length of the deceleration lane? Yes, I believe that is determined based off of 
um, your your speed and and I mean there, there's standards that are in the uh, it's called Ashto Green Book that have those in terms of um, taper lengths um, there that uh, kind of give you those those that direction and guidance in terms of what that what that taper length should be based on speeds. And then what about based on the shoulder of the road, the existing width of the shoulder of the road? Again, there's standards that are set forth there um, in terms of what uh, what what that should be. Um, you know, there's uh, oftentimes a minimum of, of two feet shoulders, but there are times when projects come through and and uh, you know there's the design exceptions and all that kind of stuff that that they wanted to add an additional lane each way, and as a result, that's going to completely remove. Um, um, shoulders, you know, so, so there are those, but there are, uh, you know, usually standards and those type of design standards and stuff like that, that are set forth to kind of help determine those, those minimums. Yeah. So you guys can follow those, right? What's that? You're saying, you're saying you have these standards that you follow when you re review the report. Yeah, yeah, we have yeah we have standards that we follow when we review the report. Yeah. I mean, like I was saying, we have stuff in our ordinances and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, standards and, and specifications and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, and I guess to your point too, Lene is, is like speaking of, you know, looking at lengths of, of D cell lanes too. I mean, there is going to be a guide for that, but depending on, you know, if, is it close to a street? Is it close to an intersection? Is it close to someone else's driveway? Now is this like for the uh, temple, for example, the right turn lane or that, Diesel lane needed to extend looking at speeds and use it needed to extend back into the property to the south but how can you go in and, and as if, if you're the the uh, temple and say hey by the way I, I need to take up some of your property for my taper to go into this right 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 uh, right turn diesel lane which you really can't because it's still their property and if there isn't a need you can't necessarily encroach on someone else's property and take it now you, you can if it's like a city project or something like that but if it's a private project i can't say well my use is is going to need me to go ahead and take some of your property I, I really can't do that so you try in some cases you have to maximize and work with the, the the constraints that are given as well you don't always get a chance to do it exactly as the way the uh the uh, book says unfortunately yeah. Oh, well, it sounds so like does we... that then, then change the rating on the street. What's that? If you have a smaller, I'm thinking of Orem Boulevard. There's one there's a housing project that has this little tiny deceller, little like I don't even know, 15 feet long or some acceleration mm -hmm. length. <clears throat> that so then you know it's kind of a hazard if I'm behind someone that then decides they want to turn in there. Does that would that change any kind of rating on that road? So now that that is a little bit different so you have to look at so i don't know if is that is that on the east side of the road though that that older housing development um yeah where is that by suggestion probably south of four south it's been yes. there for a while yes so you got to realize too the hard part is is that some of these things happened years ago and we didn't probably have all this all these re all of these resources so we thought hey this is probably the best we can because I, I know that one for, was done gosh i don't know how old that 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 one was 20 but years I, yeah i mean it's it's been a while so since then things have obviously changed we have a lot better tools and there's much bigger and broader standards that would, would help us with things like that so you're right there are some that are quite small that Looking back, or if, if they were to come through now, they would be much longer and a little bit more safe. But if you, but back to your point of you can't take the land from the developer, how do you adjust? How do you account for that then? Well, it's like it's the hard part is taking the land from someone else. So it's mm -hmm. either hey, you need to make this longer, and if you can't, then you need to change some things or reduce it. Because I know we had the same thing happen with. Uh, I want to say at Four South and Orem Boulevard, as we're redoing that intersection, there's also a right turn pocket that, that's going to be installed there, south of the Midtown 360, um, and just trying to work with constraints, even for the city. If we're trying to, to put in 
a right turn pocket and say it needed to be 120 feet and we can only get 110, well, we just based on the fact that there's a six foot diameter power pole there, then we'd probably look at, is this a design exception or do we want to spend $100,000 to move this pole when really we're only going to gain 10, 10 feet and can we live with that small amount of delay and or level of service? So sometimes it is a function of economics, but if that isn't the case and they need to get it, if, if a developer, I'm trying to think of someone where we had them go and get some property because they're development was so demanding we had they had to do it well while you think of that sam i want to maybe suggest that we move to the next and, uh, item in the agenda as soon as we can we'll, we've got 20 minutes left and uh the can projects I, can i just ask this question so my question is then if they cannot um in, you know because you don't want to take land they don't have the appropriate length of a deceleration lane. Does that, do you then demonstrate that on the report by lowering the grade or whatever you want to call it on the, on the uh, level of service? Do you ever reflect that on the report? Or show it as a negative? Well, I, I don't know if you, yes. So, so I think what you're, you're saying in a, a time where, you know, somebody has to, you know, there's only like a through, right? Maybe turning into an access or something like that. There's, and there's not enough shoulder for somebody to kind of pull off. That should be, be reflected by the, the traffic simulation software because that person behind them is likely going to have to slow down, which will, um, you know, um, decrease capacity on that, right? Um, through there. So, so that, that will come out and be reflected in in kind of the uh, the uh, um, report, just in terms of the analysis and stuff like that. Does that make sense? That does. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that uh, conversation, Brady. Obviously, a lot of questions, um, and probably more when we talk about specific projects. But uh, for the purpose of today, let's let's move on to the next item on the agenda: the uh, transportation improvement projects and again I'm gonna guess either Sam or Brady will give us an update on those yeah so I mean just as as a heads up we are moving forward with our intersection improvement project component of it here is on Center Street in front of the just on the south side of the city center essentially not allowing <laughs> left turns in at that westerly most intersection or entrance as well as some uh, work up at 8th East and 8th North. Um, also, I, I wanted to, to get an idea too, if there's been any observations you guys have had on areas in town where it looks like it needs a right turn pocket. It looks like we need a longer left turn or dual lefts. Um, is there any un, uncontrolled intersections that, that look like they, that they need to be um, controlled? Um, we're looking for this year's tip cycle uh, TIP being the, the, the Transportation Improvement Project with MAG to get funding to move forward with uh, an environmental process and get um, our Lakeview Parkway started with Geneva Road being widened to five lanes at least down to where Lakeview Parkway is going to be. We're going to go ahead and start moving forward with that project. But essentially giving you guys the option to, or I guess um, the opportunity to let us know. We, we do have a few projects that we've identified, probably looking to either put a signal or a roundabout at 4th South and 4th West. But just where I'm mainly here in my office and then I get out on occasion, if there's things that, that you guys see here in the city that need some attention, whether it's signalizing things, crosswalks, stop signs. I guess it's kind of an opportunity for you guys to kind of, to kind of share some of what you guys see as uh, traffic and transportation observations you guys see in, in, in the city on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Opportunities along sidewalks where that we can connect sidewalks and all that kind of stuff where we have gaps yeah. and stuff like that as well. Um, what you're Cycling saying. Corridors, anything like that. As we're out and about and take some notes, um, I'm going to guess that the process might be to send you guys an email just says, hey, at the corner of this and this, suggest you look at that. And then once you guys collect some of those, then we'll discuss them more in detail in, yeah. in the setting. Yeah, I think that could work. Okay. So there were two that Bobby and I talked about when we met last week. Or when we did, I can't remember. 
Um, the one is the shoulder line, the white shoulder line on Main Street in front of Windsor Elementary to kind of try to push the cars to the center of the road for the kids who are riding their bikes on the way to the elementary school. Um, maybe we could talk about that sometime in the future. And then the other one I brought up was the Quick Quack driveway on 1600 North, the easement there for Ace Hardware that um, was necessary before the light was put in just 100 feet, 150 feet down the road. But it, it because there's no shoulder on that road, it does create a, a, a situation where cars stop to turn right in there and it's quite unanticipated. Does that happen frequently? Yes, very frequently. Okay. Jeff, it looked like you had a suggestion or two. Uh, I'm typing them out, but yeah, I was okay. just going to say, I was just going to, yeah, I, I can type it out, but basically I was going to say, I like, I, cause I've been doing, trying to observe obviously very biased by my movement around the city, but like state, state in 1200 South always seems like kind of a mess. You get like a lot of backup on the 1200 South light and then it doesn't clear out by the time the red light hits on uh, Parkway. And it just yep. seems like a lot of people are kind of hitting both those lights. Uh, 400 West, this is more of a, like a potential like roundabout, but there's just massive, ma massive backlog at um, 400 West and 400 South. Did you already say that one? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Looking yeah. at potential roundabout or signal there at that location, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that one's quite bad. And then the other one that I noticed is 800 South and 800 gets really, really bad in the late afternoons. 8 South. Uh, where, where was that? 8 South and what? 800 east. It's another kind of situation where you have double lights because you have the light, you have the light coming out of the Costco. And when Costco has hot, Costco, and they put in a quick crack there recently. And so Costco and quick crack get a crazy amount of volume. So you get like a lot of backlog at that first signal. And then it kind of bleeds to the next one and just takes a lot of time to move through their traffic does not move through there very well at all. Okay. Yeah. Great. So those are my three main observations. And with some of those, we can have our, our traffic engineer maybe look at, uh, I would think, some of that signal timing and see if there could be some some tweaks or something like that that could be made to kind of help out those those uh, intersections if we're kind of seeing that. Are these uh, So, Jeff, are these all like PM peak times? Is that when you see all, all this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And AM, a, the state, the state, state 112 in south is also AM peak. State and 12th South is AM peak? 1200 South. It's that light that's the, right. The 1200 South leg? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and just as an FYI, eventually that signal will be removed. So you'll just have a right in, right out there. And, and as development happens, at least that's the plan. As development happens, then um, hopefully there, there's a connection to 1150. But that, that signal will actually be moved back further to the yeah. north. That seems like a really, it's a really weird place for a signal. It seems like there should just be like a median there. And then if you have to, for some reason, cross into the mall, just go around and flip a U-turn instead of blocking that main flow. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's actually, there's plans. The mall is looking to try and acquire some property so they can uh, account for a dual left in. Because mm -hmm. um, we understand that we need to modify the, the signal operations there at, at uh, Parkway and State. And we'd like, and part of that is moving that signal back to 1150. But, and the model shows that a dual left into the mall property works well, and a dual left out. But um, there's no condemnation rights or anything because that north east side of the intersection is all private property. So until they can accommodate for that, the signal won't be moving anytime soon. Yeah, Carl, not to mention, I think, oh. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to put in my bid again for um, 16th North and 4th East and, the you know, the traffic control there for pedestrians and cyclists on the uh, Murdoch tra Canal Trail. Um, I'd sure like to see something happen there. Maybe we, we can report back in June because Taylor did go out and he did some signal modifications there to hopefully help with compliance. Um, but we'll kind of have to to pick his brain to see what happened with that, what he saw, and then we can look at trying to implement our scramble or diagonal type crossing there. Right. Sounds good. Thanks. 
Okay. Uh, seems like conversation on this topic has died down a little bit. Um, obviously, if things come up in the interim, we can email, uh, communicate about them, and then discuss them in upcoming meetings. Um, the last item on our agenda is just questions, comments, and uh, our next meeting will be June 1st. Um, it looks like we're on a pattern for the first two, first Tuesday of each month. Yeah, correct. Okay, yeah. so uh, plan on that. Um, any comments or questions about today's meeting? Um, I had a I had a question about um, that proposed apartment complex on 16th North and Fourth West. I haven't and, heard of um, that. Is there the, actually the, something like that happening? Yeah, really. <laughs> Weird. I haven't heard anything about that. You should get out more, Sam. Yeah. I, I guess. I just thought it was smooth sailing here. Yeah. So so has the traffic study there been discussed at all in this meet, these meetings here? Or, I'm just you know wondering. what? That's, that's probably the only traffic study I've seen that is perfect, and we're just going to accept it as it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I hear in the media. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like oh my gosh i wish people would just pump the brakes a little bit it's not even close to being ready that's okay so yeah okay, guess, what did you want to discuss carl well i'm just wondering has the traffic study been completed on there or is it in progress or what they have submitted a traffic impact study um so they have completed their first iteration, but by no means have we accepted it. Okay. So uh, as I'm understanding this project, the only access is off of 1600 North. Is that correct? They have two. They have one off of 16th, and then they have another one that's off of state through an easement. I so see. There, there are two access points for this development. So I guess my concern is if people were coming out of this development and wanting to turn left onto 1600 north going east would that be a possibility or is nope. it okay so they could only turn going west yeah okay okay yeah that uh, as a result of that that project we'd require that uh um access on 1600 north where you can turn left in or left out to be um closed off with the median okay yeah, that sounds so like that... it'd be a terrible mess. Right, so and, I, and I mean, and that, and that, and that project specifically too, to a comment and question that Lene had is, is like, yeah, that's that's a project where maybe the right turn decel lane would be, say, say if it needed to be five hundred feet, well, we couldn't do that because it would physically go through the intersection, right, and be into those homes. So you kind of work with what you have, understanding too that. You know, even though the speed is posted at, what is it posted there? 35. 35, 35. 35. 35. So, I mean, so if it, it, I mean, you, you try and work with what you can and understanding it's not a, a perfect situation. But two, with that being said, you want to make sure that you're not going to create, you know, what what is the existing level of service there for, for 16th North? What is the level of service there at, at the intersection? how many trips are going to be generated because you're right. I mean, for what's going there, I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's like, so it's a residential, it's a mixed use. Okay. Likely there's not going to be a huge retail commercial demand there unless they, they dropped in a Chick-fil-A or an in and out, which is not going to be your typical type fast, fast food type places, right? Those guys have huge lines and, and then you're looking at a totally different scenario so right. it's tough it's tough because orem is built out and we're trying to work with what what we have and then we're holding them accountable to make sure that what they're putting in there is is going to work because we don't want to have something that's going to create a huge hazard to the whole pu traveling public so that's kind of where we're at with that guy okay appreciate I guess that with that, can I just add a, a big one with that is that, I mean, I live in that area, of course you all know. And um, I just want to know if a traffic study then um, considers other travel uh, routes, because like you were saying, Sam, when I come from the canyon, I do 8th North, 8th East, 1600 North to get to my house and I'm only 
two and a half blocks east of State Street. So right. I, I do not go eighth north to State Street to turn left or turn right onto 1600. You know, I don't do that just because right. I avoid State Street. So I guess that's my question on the extended impact of a development like that. Sure, and I mean, and, and that's where we look at, so if this project were to create a hundred trips and if we were to say that if we were to say 80 of those trips were were to come the same route that 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 you travel okay then we'd look at okay what's the existing conditions what are what's the capacity of 16th north as as we're heading east or uh westbound well if we already have you know six thousand cars that are heading you know or we have 500 cars or whatever how many in that in that peak hour is that going to change it if, if we're already at level of service c now we add 80 trips now we're still at a level of service c to a d obviously it it it, it increases it but is it by much i mean you, you kind of want to look at how many trips in that in that peak hour what's what's there existing and then is it now a a tipping point or not i mean for me i i think the biggest issue that's going to happen on this corridor is not going to be what's here at fourth west it's going to be whatever happens to the tech park if all of a sudden you got a big call center which is allowed to be there or if they decide to redevelop that's when you're going to see a bigger up take in in 16th north and that's where we're going to look at okay now it's probably getting to the point to where we need to widen it and maybe get into a mag funded project and we're purchasing homes to widen the corridor i mean that's that's kind of the reality i mean and, and the thing is is there's going to be folks that are going to come up 16th north going to the temple i mean yeah. those i mean and that's the hard part is you're thinking oh these these people living in this high density it's like well what are you going to say about the people going to the temple are they dirty rotten buggers too i mean they're going to the temple <laughs> you know what i mean so it's like i don't know what to say but we're, well, we're just growing the reason that that is said is because that's trips on the road that's an and that's you know like you said there's not a line for temple trip goers right <laughs> there isn't how many trips it's going to generate per day yeah uh, so that's an unknown, right? Yeah. Yeah, because so you – go oh. ahead. Well, no, I was going to change the subject. You go ahead and finish. No, it's, it's – uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Go uh, ahead. Okay, so my question is when you said about um, closing the median right there, so is, are, is Orm City, City doing that in order to accommodate the developer – to make the developer's traffic study work? To make it work? Wouldn't the developer have to close the median as part of their mitigation? Right. That's exactly right. So they would be paying for it. Well, right. But isn't that taking away an access for normal residents who, like I have a storage unit in State Street Storage. And I got a big trailer and it's easier to turn through there than if you close that off. Do they consider Well, well yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think you look at, you know, one, is it going to be safe? Too, I think when you're looking at at a PM peak type type scenario, granted, it's just like we, we had this di um, discussion about the State Street Mobility Study. During a PM peak, and if there's that big of a demand, chances are your your level of service is an F or or, or worse, right? So if I had to guess, if you're going to turn into there with your trailer. It's not going to be during the PM peak. You're probably going first thing in the morning or sometime because you're in the area. You know when the travel demand is is a lot less, and it's going to make sense for you to hurry and get down there with your trailer, get out because you know as the day go, goes on, you're not going to be able to do it. You'll be waiting there forever. So I think there's there's that component to where is it really going to really happen with the amount of queuing that's going to happen there, and then two, it's like. Okay, but if we leave that there, are we going to run the risk of accidents? Because there's going to be a few cars that are going to stop. There's going to be some that aren't. Or now, to, to Brady's point, now if if, you, if you're backed up there, there's more folks backed up there. Now now we're backed up in in into the through lane, and now we're in interrupting signal operations. Really, it doesn't make any sense to have that there. Let's go ahead and eliminate that because now there's more of a, a global impact, you know, for this little area, if you will. So that's why we would go ahead and 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 remove that and 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 likely too. It's like any more. We have a development that's going to come in on 2000 South and Geneva Road. 
right now it's just his his development. There's 200 units or 250 units, so it's pretty easy for them to do a left in and a left out. But as they come through, I also want them to run the analysis with the right in and a right out because it's not guaranteed that they will always have that there. And I want to make sure that they have the access points and that there's the decel lanes there to make that work because we're just growing so fast that what we think we have today is not going to be necessarily what, what we have tomorrow as far as, you know, at least when I, when I look at left turns. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've, uh, we've met our time frame. Um, I know that there's this discussion, particularly that particular uh, development could go on for a long, long time, but uh, we probably ought to call it. We've lost, uh, lost some bodies already. So at this point, um, let's go ahead and terminate the meeting if we can get a motion and we'll see you next month. And just to add, if any of you guys have questions about anything, Brady and I are available most any time. So if you guys have any other questions, you want to talk about things, talk, talk through things. If you want to argue about things, we can do that too. But I mean, we're, that's what we're here for. Not that I want to argue with you guys. But it's I a healthy know. debate. I mean, argue, healthy debate. What, what? Well, I, I saw Brady, I like that too. Brady reacted with a smile when you said argument. So like, it's kind of like he's waiting for one there. <laughs> anyway. Um, I make a motion that we adjourn. How about that? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. Yeah, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you all for your time. Yep, Thanks, thank everyone. You. Have a good night. Uh-huh. Thank you.